you know, I, I, you'd probably just empirically, I would say that just from observation since the 1980s, you know, that the Max Canyon probably is, was, and probably still is the single most popular classic style harrowing steelhead fly on the Deschutes River. I mean, you could probably ask Brian about that and what his observations are. You could ask Brad Staples, a few of these people that have been around forever. I think they'd probably confirm that. That was John Shuey, the author of Classic Steelhead Flies with a little tip of the hat to my old man. The greatest fly patterns of Oregon and at least 10 other game-changing fly anglers today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thank you for stopping by the show. We almost always have a fly fishing giveaway going on, and right now, if you go to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway, you can find out what we have on tap right now. You're going to have to click over there to see if it's actually a trip, or if there's some other thing we got uh, cooking in the oven. Go check it out and see what we got going. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. Trestle designs, engineers, and manufactures industry-leading outdoor products and premium apparel. From their game-changing telescopic fly rod carrier and their specialized waterproof cases and fly boxes to their magnetic nipper system that's revolutionizing the way people snip their line. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash trestle to get started right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash T-R-X-S-T-L-E. Trestle. Let's do this. Check it out right now. We are also presented today by Togan's Fly Shop, providing superior quality products at an affordable price. Great resources, fly materials, tools, fishing accessories, and pretty much the whole ciabatta. Since 2005, Togans has been delivering on price, service, and their passion, and they are taking it the next level right now. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togans. Get started right now. That's Togans, T-O-G-E-N-S, Togans Online. Togans, wetflyswing.com slash Togans. John Shuey, editor of American Fly Fishing Magazine and numerous classic books in fly fishing and beyond, shares his three-year update. It's been three years since he's been on the show. John was one of our original guests back in the teens on this podcast, and today digs into a little bit on trout flies and some of the, well, really some of the greatest trout flies and some of the personalities and the history behind the people that created them. So this is really a cool one. We focus a little bit on on Oregon today, and uh, but overall, you know, this is going to be just uh, some goodness, some good trout flies. Did I say John was was my was good peeps? This guy, this is the man. I, I love that we're doing round two and then sharing it with you today. So without further ado, here is John Shuey. John Shuey, how you doing? I'm good, Dave. Good to hear from you. Yeah, yeah, good, good to talk to you. It's been. Uh, yeah, I think it was episode 16, which is crazy to think the teens. You know, I, I remember when I first got started on this podcast, I was like, all right, who are people I kind of have a connection with? And I started there and I didn't really have a connection with you, but I kind of did through my dad and everything. So uh, absolutely. Yeah. You were gracious enough to come on the show and, and do an early episode. So thanks for doing that. Yeah. How many are you up to now? Uh, so we're over 300. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. We've been going crazy. We've been uh, we've grown this thing into definitely one of the you know one of the bigger fly fishing podcasts. And, uh, and yeah, we do two episodes a week now, which is probably double what a lot of people are doing. Yeah, that's outstanding. Yeah, so it's been fun, and we've been all over the all of the country, all over the world. Um, you know, I just got back from uh, not physically, but I was in Norway uh, talking to one of their uh, team, Norway Erlen, who's oh, cool. kind of their all-star there and we but I always like to bring it back you know what I mean because obviously you're in Oregon I'm in Oregon I'm planning on traveling up to you know Alaska and doing some cool stuff this year but um but that's kind of you know we have a lot of focus obviously in the U.S. I want to start back with you just give us the update so since episode 16 which was over three years ago what's been new with you well Dave the so I guess the biggest thing on the professional side has been uh, the um, consolidation of our three regional magazines Northwest Fly Fishing Southwest Fly Fishing and Eastern Fly Fishing into a single title called American Fly Fishing and we'd had that as a digital only version for 10 or 12 years but uh, you know the economy and and the uh, the way that people's tastes for where they get their media have changed. Uh, that's a long way of saying that a lot of people don't read anymore, especially you know younger yeah. younger generations. So it sort of forced our hand a little bit to to re-strategize. You know, our three regional titles probably weren't going to be economically viable for a lot longer, anyways. So our longtime uh, 
founding publisher, Steve Cole, sort of made the call saying, you know, we need to do something kind of dramatic here. And and uh, so we did that. And, you know, so far, so good. And mm-hmm. and then as of last year, uh, so Steve Cole, our founding publisher, he he and John Luke, the late John Luke, developed the magazines back in uh, the late 1990s. So it's been a long time. And uh, he also, Steve Cole also, uh, just a few years ago, partnered into a uh, boutique theater in this the town where he lives in Winthrop. And it's called The Barnyard. And he was putting more and more time into that. And he just, you know, that's one of his other passions. So he decided that, you know, maybe it's time to find a buyer for this magazine and keep the magazine in good hands and, and you know, let me sort of retire from that part of the of the fly fishing world and and put more energy into his theater business and, and you know, keep his fly fishing, you know, put his fly fishing back in the private sector, so to speak. So there you go. He was able to uh, to broker a, a sale with a company called Village Press, which also publishes um, magazines that a lot of your listeners are probably familiar with, the Pointing Dog Journal, mm. the Retriever Journal, and a few others. And so they've been around for about 60 years. And uh, over the years, I've, I've written uh, many times for Pointing Dog Journal, so I already knew the editor. And uh, wow. so it's been a, you know, a fairly seamless transition. I mean, there's a lot of work involved in learning new protocols and processes, but we're all, you know, kind of getting up to speed on that. So but that's awesome. Thanks for that update. And yeah, and that hits right in your wheelhouse, right? You're a big bird hunter and there's a lot of fly fishermen that are that are into bird hunting. And I was just talking to uh, somebody from Gray's, you know, another magazine that I th- probably is going through lots of you know changes as well. And, you know, I think they said, I think they were saying, you know, a good chunk, like almost 90% of their audience, you know, fly fishes and bird hunts. Do you feel like your readers is a similar demographic that people are like lots of hunters? I think so, Dave, you know, and it's hard to, uh, you know, put a number on it unless you're doing reader surveys and we haven't done that, you know, in this case, but yeah, I think just empirically a lot of my fellow fly anglers are also wing shooters. Yeah, that's right. Nice. And it, you know, and, and some of the, you know, some of the people that I've known for many, many years, you know, are definitely as, as deeply invested in one as the, as they are the other. Exactly. I love it too. I've, I've had to choose, you know, mainly because I'm busy with kids and stuff, but, uh, you know, I've, I've let the, uh, the bird hunting take a back seat for a little while and the duck hunting, but, uh, but it's always there. You know what I mean? I have, I still have the gut, I still have the shotgun and stuff so I can always get into it. So maybe we'll leave the, uh, the bird hunting talk for another podcast. If we yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's weird though. I've noticed that, uh, you know, my passion is uh, hunting chuckers and, oh, uh, nice. I've been doing that for a long, long time. And, um, you know, it, it's all, it's not about killing the birds. It's about yeah. watching those dogs work and walking that great country. But, uh, you know, it's weird, Dave. I mean, it seems like every passing year climbing those hills just doesn't seem to be getting any easier. Right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. And for you, you too, like steelhead wise, I always think of, cause John Shu, you know, when people say your name, it's like, okay, classic steelhead flies, you're a big steelhead fisherman, but I know, you know, you don't do a lot of winter steelhead fishing anymore, right? You kind of use that as your hunting time. Is that kind of still the case? Yeah, I mean, I, I would. The chucker season in Oregon goes until January 31st, and in Nevada it goes till February 15th. So, you know, I'd I'd much rather be walking those those high ramparts in the winter and you know watching my dog work than uh, standing in a freezing cold river. Exactly. So, you know, these days I kind of save my winter steelhead fishing until March, and you know, yeah. traditionally get a few licks in down on the North Umpqua when the buds are you know the alder buds are on the trees already. So. That's right. That's right. Well, there's a there's a topic for you. I don't even I hadn't even heard about this, but somebody I think wrote a comment is uh, Frank Moore. Uh, I haven't heard. Is there is there news there? Frank Moore passed away this past weekend. Uh, oh you know, wow. About a week, yeah, about a week shy of his 99th birthday, and it of course sends a a huge and saddening ripple you know throughout the fly fishing community. I you know he was a Frank was a singularity. You know they just they don't make him like him and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could talk on Frank, you know, for the for the next hour, but yeah, it's uh, you know, and, and I'm still, and like a lot of us who who are his friends, you know, I'm I'm still sort of absorbing it and and processing it. You know, it's just it's it's the loss of an icon, I know. and uh, it's a tough one. And he went through. I mean, yeah, the last the, the, with the fires we've had and stuff. I mean, that was it's been a crazy whirl in the last few years, right? Because their house got yeah. right that started. Yeah, he lost his house. Yep, mm-hmm. lost his house. I'm sure that yep. helped to. And, uh, yeah, and I had Frank on, I don't even have the episode in front of me, but it was one of the few interviews that I actually drove down to the North Umpqua and went to his house and sat there and, and walked his property with him. And it was, yeah, he was just, you know, I always talk about that because I shook his hand at the time. I think he was, uh, this was a few years ago and I mean, he pretty much crushed my hand. He was so yes. strong. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, absolutely. 
so yeah anyways well i will i'm gonna hopefully do something for frank here on you know what i mean i'm not sure what you do at this point right i guess you celebrate a, an amazing person in life right that's kind of where we are yeah i think so i mean i think it, an awful lot of us are, are in this fly fishing world are still sort of processing you know it's still pretty new and but you know the the thing about frank moore was that for a lot of people meeting him was a life-changing experience you know spending time with him yeah and not many people can say that about, you know, about anyone that, that just meeting a person and spending time with them can be a life changing experience. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like the, I think it's similar to, you know, for those that know, like Lefty Cray, right? I mean, I'm not sure if I've never met Lefty, but I've heard so many stories that he was a similar thing where when you met Lefty, you know, you knew right away he was kind of a unique person. Did you ever hear or connect with Lefty? Sure. Yeah. I mean, he, oh, and really? he was, yeah. And he was, you know, really a genuine person person i mean it's even going all the way back to the the first time that i connected with him you know he was just very genuine yeah and and passionate you know uh, passionate about the things he cared about yeah well we won't go dig in too much to, more to the sad stuff because i think you know this is all about uh you know <laughs> i mean trying to stay positive here but uh no i mean i think it is it's fly fishing right i mean we are a community a small community and, and the more you get into this it's like my dad right i get i'll stay on the, the the sad stuff a little bit you know my dad is an amazing guy but you know he's getting older and as he gets into his mid 80s you know uh stuff you know he's not even getting out fishing that much anymore you yeah, know, and, yeah, and all that stuff, and you're just like, wow. I guess I mean that's that's life, and I I mean I don't know how do you handle. I guess you talk about it and stuff like that, which we're doing here, um, and, and none of it's easy. But um, I, I kind of think about it like passing on to the next generation. I guess I do. Do you see? I it think like, so. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of it, right? You, you've done <laughs> you've done a lot of that with the work you did. Let, let's go back to the magazines here. So you've got this one magazine now. I'm really curious because when you consolidate. You know, you had Northwest Fly Fishing, which was a huge magazine for, obviously, people in the Northwest. It was the place to go. You wanted to yeah. check out a new spot, a new destination. You knew where to go. When you consolidate all these magazines, the three kind of into the one, how does that change how you do your job? Well, it doesn't change my job that much. It's just it actually, in some senses, reduces my workload a little bit. But um, essentially, the challenge now is, you know, how do you keep a majority of the people happy? And by happy, I mean our subscriber base. You know, we, of course, there were people that were not happy with the transition and, uh, you know, that would tell me, you know, that's not what I signed up for, et cetera, et cetera. And I get that, you know, I mean, if you signed up for a magazine specifically about the Pacific Northwest fly fishing scene, you know, American fly fishing may not be it for you. But yeah. You know, on the, on the other side of that, I, I explained to, you know, some of our longtime subscribers, I was very honest with them. I said, you know, our choice within a few years based on trajectories was probably going to be giving you American fly fishing, you know, a little bit broader coverage area than you're, than you really want or giving you nothing at all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so, so that was kind of the choice that was going to come within a few years based on the fact that, you know, across the board with niche, with most niche magazine genres, Subscriber rates are sliding, and in many cases, uh, advertising revenue is also sliding. So, you know, the the entire magazine media is uh, facing, you know, a, a lot of challenges right now and, and learning how to navigate those challenges and uh, changing what we do in terms of our, our, you know, going from three magazines to one. That was our overarching strategy to sort of uh, navigate these waters. And it's not for everyone, but by the same token... I've had an equal number of people within the last, you know, several issues contact me and say, yeah, I love it. I love the new magazine, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. And the thing that I'm always cognizant of is what built our brand was that we focus on publicly accessible fly fishing waters throughout the nation. And even in the regional days when we had the three magazines, that was the genre. We were focused on telling people about places to go fishing that were accessible. Um, you know, the other magazines, the you know, fly fishermen and, uh, the other, the other magazines yep. that have, have a, have a great track record, you know, they do, they can handle the exotic destinations. They can handle, you know, doing a lot more technique. That's, that's their thing. And, and I've never wanted to duplicate that. Um, we've, you know, in, in the last, uh, four years, uh, two of the, of the longstanding magazines have gone out of business in the fly fishing world. And part of that I think might be because they, they, couldn't quite um, come up with an identity that was different. And we have a we have that identity in, in terms of what we do that's different than the other magazines. And so I think, you know, my job is to, to keep, you know, 
make sure I'm holding on to that identity that makes us a little bit different. And uh, even though we, we may not be able to, to please everybody, you never can, you know, I can create, I think I can create an editorial mix with each issue and with each annual, you know, set of issues that's pretty appealing, you know, without trying to duplicate the other magazines. Exactly. So when people come to now to American Fly Fishing, they go there and they're going to see, uh, describe that. What are they going to see? Talk about when the next issue, how many, uh, how many are coming out per year. Uh, and then, yeah, we do. We're still sitting at six issues a year and, uh, most of the issues will have, uh, six feature length articles about destinations. So that mix, you know, for example, I mean, I, I don't remember the exact mix of the next issue offhand, but a typical issue might have a, a feature article about a, a place in, in Washington, and then a feature article about a river in Colorado and maybe a, a cool place in, in Texas, a well-known famous water in Pennsylvania, a completely unknown but very productive river in Virginia, and maybe even something in the Florida Keys. So that that's the kind of mix that we're looking for. You know, we're, we are trying to spread it around in a way that, that uh, not only appeals to our, our former regions, but also gives, uh, you know, for example, someone in, in – uh, Oregon here might be reading that. And, and so we have this upcoming story about a river in Texas. That's just super cool. I'm not going to let it out of the, mm-hmm. out of the bag. It's not an unknown river, but it's just a yep. super cool place. And even as an Oregonian, I'm sitting here reading that story in the editing process and looking at the photos thinking, man, that, that is just cool. I mean, that's a place that would have a draw for me. Yeah. And, but we know we can't do that with every place we cover. One of the challenges you face is it's a lot easier to motivate fly anglers from the East to travel West than it is to motivate fly anglers from the West to travel East. Right. And that's just a battle. I don't, I, I just don't think you really want to work too hard to fight that battle. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, us, we, we, you know, you and I, Dave, we may not want to read about a river in New York, but that doesn't mean that the people in Virginia and North Carolina and Ohio, they, they may very well want to read about that river because they're going to go there. Exactly. So I can't please everybody. I love that. No, I love that. So why is that? Why, why do you think that East folks want to come West, but West or vice versa? Yeah. East folks don't want to come out West, but West, I guess I'm getting it mixed up. Why <laughs> well, that? yeah, I know what you're saying. It's, yeah. you know, traditionally it's just because of the, the, the great waters of the West, you know, Montana, Idaho, you know, Oregon, Washington, Wyoming, you know, these are states that for decades have been famous for their amazing fly fishing waters, which, you know, traditionally are driven by, by native trout and wild trout populations. And uh, so, you know, historically, if you look across the nation, the fly fishing world, everybody knows about the Madison. Everybody knows about right. the Deschutes. People from back East, you know, they yearn to, to make that pilgrimage to these places and, and they do. You know, so, yeah, uh, but, but, you know, you and I, we can read about places that we know about back east. We can read about, you know, the famous spring creeks of Pennsylvania, but it's going to be awfully hard for you and me to drive past Silver Creek or the Henry's Fork, you know, in, I mean, yeah. I'm talking about psychologically driving by them. You know, it's, it's going to be pretty difficult for you and I and people about out here in the west to say, yeah, I'm going to forego the Henry's Fork. I'm going to forego the Missouri tailwater. I'm going to forego Silver Creek right. because I'm going to go back to Pennsylvania. So it's it's just kind of a hard sell. Yeah. No, and I hear you. And I definitely, my goal is to, and I, and I know I can't do this in my whole life, but I plan on going to every single spot. You know what I mean? Like that's just, right. I'm, I'm setting the bar high because I want to go to, you know, I want to go to, well, we just had an episode in Virginia, the Shenandoah. We had uh, Harry yep. Murray who talked about yep. uh, fish and brook trout and, and it was amazing. You know, the guy was super awesome and. And we've got a ton of people in the Northeast and, you know, and all that. So, and I'm excited again, but it comes down to that. How do you go, how do you, you can't go to all those places. So part of it is like reading about it, you know, or listening to a podcast. So your magazine helps those people, you know, whether it's on the West or East, they can read about this Texas spot and be like, oh man, maybe I won't ever get there, but at least I'm going to know about this. And it's on the bucket list, right? I think that's part of it. You know, I think a lot of us are sort of armchair travelers and, you know, we, uh, we sit there and we read those stories and we see the appeal and we think, yeah, that sounds pretty cool, you know, but sounding pretty cool and then pulling the trigger to travel 3000 miles are two different things. But, you yeah. know, having said that, you know, I, I need to be fair to our, our people back East. I mean, if you want to go explore the world of smallmouth bass fishing that yeah. we just can't even envision out here. No. Oh my gosh, you know, go to the Midwest, go to the, exactly. the mid Atlantic, you know, I mean, wow. Yeah. They have yep. some spectacular fisheries, you know, that are yeah. just that, that put anything that we can imagine in terms of smallmouth bass out here to shame. 
Exactly. Yeah, that's what it's the it's the native fish of the Midwest, right? I love, yeah, I love that yeah. quote. <laughs> yep. So, okay, so basically you guys are doing a lot of the same. I mean, you're basically just and it makes sense. I mean, you look at the way we did this, you know, when we started out, we were really focused on steelhead and then we slowly expanded out to the whole pretty much all around the US and you know, and we didn't really lose too many. You know, I think probably a few people still want to hear, um, you know, steelhead episodes. And we still go back to that. It's not like you guys are leaving those issues, right? You're still going to hit hard on some of the Northwest topics, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no question. You know, we have a uh, we have a wonderful piece coming up in the next issue by uh, Dave McCoy up in, in uh, Seattle. Oh, yeah. And uh, he just did a terrific piece on on fly fishing for sea run cutthroat in Puget Sound. And of course, he's a world class photographer to go along with it. So, That's right. you know, so, yeah, we're, we're definitely I, I'm very cognizant of the number of subscribers we have here in the Pacific Northwest. And I need to take care of them, you know, and uh, and at the same time, you know, one of the things that we've done over the last uh, year and a half or so is we've started to work in some new column departments mm. that uh, sort of touch on on a variety of topics that can be both peripheral to fly fishing and very central to fly fishing, but don't involve destination. And the challenge there is to try to be different. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to run a six page or eight page story about Euro nymphing, you know, right. and I, I have nothing wrong with that, but I mean, the other magazines have handled that brilliantly. Uh, it's just, it's, you know, it's, I don't need to retread that ground. We did do a piece last year on trout spay. And I think we did it in a way that, that, you know, provided some, inst- some great instruction covered a little bit of new ground and, uh-huh. and uh, presented it in a way that, you know, that, that uh, wasn't duplicating the other magazines. So that's my goal with some of our new departments that we're running is, you know, is to present some information in a way that's not duplicating what the other magazines are doing. Because, you know, the other magazines out there, several of them have really done a wonderful job of sort of diving into that technique genre for so many years. And, uh, you know, that's not our wheelhouse and, and shouldn't be. No. And trout spay, that is a good topic because that's a hot topic. Sure. Is that out there? Where could you find that? And then also— I don't who... remember which issue it was in, Dave. I, You know, I, I get the issues yeah, yeah, jumping. Yeah, too much. I can't have to produce so many of them. But I think it was one of the issues last fall. Last fall, yeah. Done by a guy out uh, from Montana who did a great job with it. And, and uh, yeah, you know, the one, one good—even though our website's sort of in stasis right now with the new ownership, you know, there's still an index on that website that helps you, uh, f- you know, find stories and everything, so— if any of your uh, listeners want to know what issue it is, they can just send me an email and I can grab it for them. Okay, good, good. We'll, we'll do that then. And then, and then, how do you so trout space? So you have somebody writing this article. How does that work on somebody you finding this person to write it? Because there's tons of people that could write a trout space article, right? How do you find the right one? Yeah, well, I mean, the, I, the funny thing, Dave, there's not tons of people that can write a oh, trout really? space article, and and that's not because there's not a lot of great you know trout space innovators out there. It's just that it's not easy being a writer. And, oh, yeah. you know, it's it's uh, there's a lot of people that like the idea of being a writer. But, you know, when you see their product come in to my editing desk, you know, it, it's yeah, a lot of it ends up being sort of ghostwritten. So, oh, right. It's really, you know, one of the challenges we all face in the media is especially the fly fishing media is finding those contributors who strike that wonderful balance of being uh, very competent at fly angling and very competent at writing. When you find that person and then you add the third element, which is they can actually spell the word deadline, (laughs) then you've got the, then you've really got the gems that you want to keep working with for many, many years. (laughs) And and if you can find that same person that can set their ego aside, yeah, um, you know, that, that's really critical to being a a journalist, you know, I mean, it's, I, I had a professor many, many years ago when I was in college and I'll never forget what he said. And it was uh, something along the lines of, as a as a journalist, when you write a story and you write a, a a sentence or a paragraph that you find to be particularly witty and particularly clever, you should immediately cut it because you have begun serving your ego instead of serving your reader. Oh wow, there you go. So cut out the fluff. Cut out the stuff that's serving your ego. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's that's really good. So think of yeah, and, and I guess that's kind of what I try to do as well. You know, think of the listener, the reader. You know, you're serving them. So how do you absolute something useful? Well, let's take this for example. Let's say I have a trip coming up to Alaska, and it's this really amazing remote trip where we're going into some unnamed uh, area. We can't even tell you the name of the river, but we're going to have this great time in the early summer. Um, and I want to write an article about it and get it into your magazine. What does that look like? And I'm also not the greatest writer. What does that process look like? And is there any chance of getting? Uh, you know, what would you recommend for that? I'm glad you framed it that way, Dave, because the chances of that happening are 
are probably very minimal because what my answer is going to be, okay, so you're going with a, an on an outfitted trip to a remote Alaska water that very few people get to go mm. to because there's only, you yep. know, a four week season and each right. week they can only accommodate eight people. That's incredibly yep. exclusive and expensive. Yeah. So what I'm going to tell that p- potential contributor is, you know, that's just not what we do. I want to present by and large, I want to present material to our readers about places that they can go to that, that are accessible. Yeah. If, you know, and, and of course we all have to pay the bills. If your outfitter comes back and, and says, well, you know, I do have spots to fill. So how about we trade uh, editorial package for an advertising package? You know, how about, how about I spend some money to get this story in your magazine? Then I'm going to listen. But when I present it, if, if a, a deal like that goes down where we can sell an advertising package and part of that package is that we have to provide some editorial at the bottom of each page of that story, it's going to say advertorial. Yeah. It'll say it. So I'm identifying yeah. to my readers that this is exactly what this is. And even when we do that, I'm not going I'm, to, I'm absolutely going to present the truth. You know, if you went out there and had a crappy experience, you know, we're going to revisit this whole thing. But, but yeah, by and large, Dave, you know, my, gotcha. my goal with this magazine is, has always been to uh, provide readers with accessible destinations that are mm-hmm. reasonably, you know, close to home and, and just doable for them. That's right. Uh, you know, and, and of course, we have a, a cross section of of uh, economic demographic, and you know just because all of our readers can't afford to make that expedition down to fish for redfish in Louisiana doesn't mm-hmm. mean that some of our readers don't want to do it. So as long as I'm presenting it in a way that's accessible to a lot of our readers, meaning that it's it's uh, reasonably accessible, it's public water, I'm not selling out to highlight a single outfitter or a single guide, that kind of thing. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. With over 40 years of experience in coffee, the Angler's Coffee team roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind. Joe's goal is to deliver excellent coffee to every single angler. And I can definitely attribute to this. I got right now a pack, a new uh, three pack in my uh, in the mailbox. I can't wait to break it out when I get back. And I think this one actually has some of the designs, some of the cool artwork that Joe has going. So check this out. I'm going to be, be loving this. I, I've been using the uh, the Muddler blend. That's kind of, I think, kind of like the medium roast. Um, so that's been good. But these artist series, Joe sends $1 for each sale to Casting for Recovery, another amazing program out there. Joe has a blend for every taste, a dry hopper on the go option, um, pretty much a little bit of everything to serve you need. If you're an angler, which I know you are, and you love coffee, which there's a good chance you do, then Angler's Coffee is the brand and, uh, and company you want to support. And uh, and so let's do it right now. Wetflyswing.com slash anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S, A-N-G-L-E-R-S. That sounds like a, a cheer right there. Let's get a cheer going. Support this podcast and a great company right now by clicking through that link. Okay, let's get back to the show. When you look back at over you know the last year or two that you've been doing this, are there say a handful of uh, articles you know or pieces you've written or you've you know published that stick out to you like say you know ten or eight of these things that or, or do they all blend together and you've got so many because I mean what do you guys do like forty or fifty? Uh, how many pieces are you looking at a year? Typically around thirty six feature length articles per year and and yeah they do start all blending together for me but you know on on occasion I will myself produce a story, a feature story for the magazine. And when I do that myself, I try to lead by example for the other contributors. You know, I try to produce a piece that that sort of um, encapsulates what I want from other contributors in terms of, you know, the approach, the destination, the photo package, um, how to captivatingly mm-hmm. present a story without serving my own ego, you know. Uh, I don't want to yep. sit back when that when when my own story is published. I don't want to sit back and go, "Wow, I was pretty clever about that." What I want to do is is read that article with a critical eye and say, "Okay, I think that I did a pretty good job of serving my readers." And so, you know, I use I did one in 2018 on the the uh, wilderness section of the Rogue River. Oh yeah, I did one a couple a year or two ago about uh, the fisheries on Steens Mountain, and. When I so when I do these these feature stories myself for the magazine, I really hold them up as the standard bearer for our other contributors, or at least I try to. And I think it helps. I think it helps our contributors sort of get a feel for, you know, what I'm talking about when I tell them to, you know, kind of check your ego at the door and serve our audience. 
That's right. How could we find all the recent ones that you've, is this like one a year, a couple a year that you've written? Yeah, you know, I probably do maybe one a year or so. And that's only because it's a, a time commitment thing for me. But um, but yeah, again, you know, I think the index on the website or just shoot me an email or, you know, yeah. whatever. Or, or hey, subscribe. <laughs> or subscribe. Yeah, let's do that. Let's get some yeah, people to subscribe. That. <laughs> so I, I think what I, I might do is follow up with you after this and maybe get a list of, because I would love to have, I always, th- I think of a list because it, it helps people. So I get a, a little list of maybe some stuff you've written sure. so people can get a sure. feel for it and check it out. And, and that sounds like the stuff that really resonates. Um, so you got all this going. This is great to hear. The magazine, obviously, there's some changes, and there's always going to be changes with with everything. I think you know, if any business, if you're staying stagnant and not changing, you're, you're probably falling behind. You know what I mean? So I think yeah, it yeah. sounds like this is probably a good thing for you guys. I think so. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Let's go into your books because you've got—I don't even know how many books you've written, but you've got a ton of books out there. And uh, the classic Steelhead Flies is one that always you know resonates when your name is out there because it's such a great. And I love the history. So. Let's dig into a little bit of history here uh, for a second and talk about your new book. Describe that book. So the latest one is a a book called Favorite Flies for Oregon, 50 Essential Patterns from Local Experts. If you've seen the classic Steelhead Flies book, this is sort of almost like a light version of that concept, but it's not just Steelhead Flies. It's a a lot of trout flies, you know, probably dominated by trout flies. But the fun part of this one was, uh, again, for me, it's always digging into the the history of the genre, and in this case, very organ, you know, completely organ centric. And so I actually, you know, as a historical researcher, you should always, you know, be learning a lot. And I learned a lot, a lot of information I didn't know, but, you know, a lot of, it, it's sort of a sleuthing game, which is sort of appealing to me. And uh, not only did I learn about some, some forgotten fly tires, uh, whose names, you know, are never mentioned anymore that, you know, even I hadn't heard of in Oregon, uh, but but also revisiting some historical Oregonians that I had researched in the past and, you know, finding new information about them. And then on top of that, getting the opportunity to reconnect with some old friends and, you know, who who are still major contributors to Oregon's history of, of uh, a very rich history of fly tying. Uh, you know, it was great reconnecting with Randall Kaufman. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think if if you were to consider who is the yeah. very best known of all Oregon uh, fly originators. I think Randall Kaufman's at the top of the list. I mean, is, you know, and, and, you know, there's, there's two schools of thought on Randall Kaufman's flies there. I've run into people over the years who say, well, he just kind of copied the stimulator. And I go, that's not (laughs) accurate. You know, it's not accurate. Randall, Randall Kaufman was a fly innovator from way back in his teenage years. People don't realize that long before he opened a fly shop, he was creating patterns to meet his needs. And, you know, the, the true story behind the stimulator is that Randall did what we all do. He plucked the characteristics of certain flies that he liked, the certain characteristics, and he melded them together into a new fly yeah. pattern. And that's how virtually all of our flies come about. So the occasional criticism of his flies, I think, is completely unfounded. But the uh, the frequent uh, accolades given to his ingenuity, I think, are very well-founded. Yeah. And uh, so it was really great reconnecting with him. Um, of course, my old friend, Dave McNeese, you know, he, oh, yeah. as I said in the book, you know, had, had he or I thought about it back in the 1980s when Umqua Feather Merchants was becoming the company that right. launched, uh, launched uh, contract fly tires, you know, some of Dave's pattern would have probably been put into commercial production back, you know, back then. Uh, but we just, it, we didn't think about it, you know, but he's, he's very creative and, uh, and always, you know, entertaining for me to consult on on uh, certain historical details. And then, you know, you take what he says, cut it in half and you're somewhere near the truth, but <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I love, I love Vic Deese. We, yeah, we had, we had I, a wonderful place. Yeah, no, I, we had Vic Deese. I love, I can't remember the episode. I'll put a link in the show notes, but uh, we got into that whole story of the, uh, like the, the feds come to his house for the flight tying thing. And it was really, oh, yeah. it was funny. <laughs> it was, I mean, the whole thing was funny and crazy at the same time, but he told that story and I was like, wow, this is, this is maybe the craziest story we've ever heard on this podcast, right? Well, you know, you have to, you have to have it. <laughs> See, I, I should be present at every Dave McNeese interview as the on-site fact check. That's right. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta listen <laughs> to that. You gotta see how much of that is truth because we did a whole podcast right. episode on it. <laughs> but, Amazing. you know, then I also, you know, I got to uh, reconnect with Ken Morris, you know, down in Southern Oregon and, oh, yeah. and he's a great fly tire. And then, you know, I also got to, uh, to dig up some history on some, some Oregon flies that have virtually been forgotten, but which definitely should still be in the forefront. You know, the, right on the cover of the book is the beetle bug coachman. And, uh, 
I mean, that's one of, that's one of the just great all-time dry flies. And uh-huh. uh, it turns out that the history of that fly goes a lot deeper than I thought it did. And, you know, and then, you know, there were some, some other flies, uh, in, including from some of the relative newcomers on the organ fly tying scene, like Garrett Lesko, who did a oh, yeah. terrific uh, sculpin pattern. And, uh, yeah, so it was, it was fun, you know, just sort of connecting with people, reconnecting with some people. And believe me, I could have, and I, and I certainly hope none of my old friends and acquaintances in the Oregon fly fishing scene are offended if their flies are not included. But right. as I explained in the, as I explained in the book, you know, in the, in the front matter of the book, I had to limit it to, to 50 flies and that's always going to be a subjective process. And, yeah. you know, Anybody who's going to create a 50 best list, the, the lists are all going to be different. And so, yeah. of course, I left out some uh, some wonderful flies by some terrific people and, you know, uh, and hopefully at least rectified that to some extent by explaining the process in the front matter of the book. But, you know, I, I, it was a fun book to do and, and I hope people enjoy it. And, uh, and you know, and, and interestingly enough, the book before that, which also came out this last year, I did a book all about hummingbirds. Hmm. Wow called the hummingbird handbook it was a chance to uh embrace you know in book form another one of my interests which is you know not just the natural world but but birds in general and and that book has done uh, surprisingly well i guess surprisingly for me it's done done surprisingly well uh and it just sort of i think it touched a little bit of a nerve where where people who aren't even bird watchers necessarily are yeah. just fascinated by hummingbirds of course. I am too. I mean, it's one of those things where you see those little guys outside your window and you're like, so how many times is that wing going up and down in, in a second? Yeah, they're they're beating their wings. The local species, you know, 50 to 70 times per second. I mean, they're... Wow. They're, how is that even possible, right? You're like, yeah, how right. is that possible? Well, that's nothing. They have a heart rate of, you know, 500 to 1,000 beats per second too, or per minute too. So, you know, it's like, wow. holy cow. Yeah, yeah. It's intense. So... So yeah, you got the hum- and you have a bunch of other books. We'll put some links to some of that in the show notes. I, I want to um, keep on the on the people you mentioned, and so far you mentioned a few people. I've had all of them on the podcast except for oh, Randall good. Kaufman, yeah, who I'd love to get Randall on as well, and uh, hopefully we will eventually. Um, and, and you also mentioned the fifty. I, I hear you because I think the Fly Fisherman magazine came out with a. Um, I think it was something like fifty. Maybe it wasn't fifty. Maybe it was like the twenty greatest fly fishermen of the. Tw- you know what I mean? And and sure. I talked to some people that weren't on there, like Kelly Gallup. We had a podcast, and Kelly Gallup was was. You know what I mean? Same thing. He was kind of joking about. It. He's like, you know what? You know they're not writing the history books with that article. You that's know, right. It comes out. Yeah, that's right. so that's yeah. that's kind of what it is. But I am curious on this because it is cool. I mean, Ken, uh, you know, Morris, Dave uh, McNeese, and they're all big. And who else would you th- – well, let, let's start with the fly. So Dave McNeese, what fly? Did you guys do one person and one fly, or how did you do that? No, I I just selected a group of fly patterns. And, for example, like Ken Morris, I think, has four flies in the book, and Randall has maybe four flies in the book. And gotcha. um, so, you know, it was just sort of, of uh, you know, sort of processing through. I mean, Polly Rossborough, of course – would be the one man who you might say, okay, well, if Randall's not the best known fly tire of all time from Oregon, then certainly it's Polly Rossboro. But, right. you know, I could, I mean, you could do a whole book about Polly Rossboro's patterns. You could, you know, you could present 50 Polly Rossboro patterns. He, he had, right. you know, 10 or 12 that are pretty well known, but <clears throat> like most of us, he was a great tinkerer and, and he developed many different fly patterns. Of course, luckily he did his own books, so <laughs> I didn't have yeah. to. But you got, yeah, Polly's got his own stuff. What's one out there? Yeah. So, you know, in that case, I'm like picking a couple of his flies and saying, you know, I I need to put a sampling in because I need to represent him. Yeah. represent. So what's a good fly that represents Polly? Well, one of my favorites is his little yellow stone fly. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I just think that's just the coolest fly. And what's interesting about it is it's it's a little fore and aft pattern. So it has a hackle on the front and back and it has this little bright yellow body and a little red tail. And to illustrate what he was imitating, I got a photograph from Brian O'Keefe of a little yellow stonefly um, with a bright red butt. So, you know, it's pretty cool to have that. A real stonefly. A real stonefly. Yeah. The real thing. The real critter. With a red butt. Because you don't think a stonefly is having a red butt too often. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, pretty interesting in that in that sense. You know, and in some cases, I was just like looking for a way to represent some of the people that I think you know, have sort of been influential in Oregon and, and been important. And yeah, I mean, one of the other qualifications is you got to be a nice person. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I sort of right. draw a line there, but you know, a great example of that is uh, Brian Sylvie. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, you know, Brian ties just beautiful flies. He's, he's as adept at tying a uh, classic style harrowing steelhead fly as anybody, but 
that's not really really not what he's known for. You know, he's got his fly called the Sylvanator. And I think it would be, uh, you know, I, I think that I just thought that fly has to be in the book and Brian has to be in the book. And sort of, so that was sort of a convergence that worked really well for me. I was able to, to take, you know, represent Brian and also represent a fly that's, that's really well known. I mean, his, his Sylvanator is a very well known steelhead fly. So that was, an, that's just one example of, of sort of a scissorgy that worked out pretty well. That's it. Give us a little poly rot. So for somebody that doesn't know Paul, the whole thing, give us a quick little brief history on why Polly was such a big player. Well, Polly was a, he was sort of a, a uh, enigmatic personality in a lot of ways, but he lived down on the, on the uh, Williamson river for a lot of his life and was a great uh, student of, a, of aquatic life. So he would spend a lot of time just watching and, and observing and learning. And he didn't really have a great deal of classic training in fly tying and fly design. So he, he combined what he did know from reading, you know, reading other people's material with his own innovations. And in doing so, came up with a series of flies that uh, are still productive to this day. And he was a, inch, a very interesting personality. I mean, in the early days of McNeese's Fly Shop, Dave brought Polly up as a personality to bring people into the shop and help promote the shop. And Polly drew hordes of people to the shop because his, he had this forceful personality. He was, he was entertaining. He was funny. He was cantankerous. Uh, he was interesting. He was knowledgeable. Um, and he was just a lot of fun to be around. And in fact, uh, one of the Portland beer companies back in those days actually celebrated him with a special beer that they created so oh, really? you know, when when you get a, a beer made in your honor you probably arrived right that's right <laughs> you made it yeah you made it so i'm trying to on his fly type what was his uh if you think Paul Ro- what was his kind of uh you know he had the, he had a book that sort of encapsulated it called the fuzzy nymphs and uh oh yeah and so he was he was a big believer in using natural of course back in those days it was all natural furs but he would you know use a variety a lot a wide variety of natural furs um, sometimes singularly and sometimes blended together to create the look that he wanted. And the and the one of his important aspects of his wet flies was blending these furs in a way that underwater they looked really natural. Maybe you know the the, the fibers trapped a few tiny tiny air bubbles to to help the appeal of the fly. And so he was sort of uh, definitely ahead of the game. You know, sort of an innovator in in that respect. Yeah. And McNeese, what did you put in? Uh, pick out a McNeese fly you picked on. Well, funny because, you know, when you think about Dave McNeese's flies, they are ephemeral. I mean, one of the, one of the hallmarks of a Dave McNeese steelhead fly is he'll never tie it the same way twice. Oh, wow. You know, so, I mean, it, 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 and, and that goes back a lot of years. I mean, Dave's an artist, and yeah. and you see that in his fly tying in the way that, you know, I, I don't think, I think Dave would be bored stiff if he, if he had to tie the same fly the same way every time. I think it would huh. just drive him right out of fly tying. He just loves to tinker. He's a feather artist and a, a graphic artist, you know, in terms of the way he thinks. Uh, so the fly I chose was actually a, a little known one, a, a imitation for the October caddis. And uh, it's an you know, innovative little fly that he put together. And I, I remembered it from the fly shop days back in the mid 80s. And when I asked him, you know, I said, hey, this is kind of what I'm interested in. You know, he was pretty excited about that. I think it had been a long time since someone had asked him about that fly. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly I could have added, you know, I could have put his, some of his steelhead flies in the book, but, you know, I, I have to ride that line between, is this a fly that's, that's sort of well known in Oregon's fly tying history at some point, or am I just sort of putting this in because I want to represent his artisanship? So I had to sort of draw some lines there and, and putting a Dave McNeese steelhead fly in the book means that, you know, I have to decide what is the dressing for this fly. And yeah. does this fly have any kind of a track record? You know, and that's the thing with most of Dave's right. steelhead flies. There, there really wasn't much of a track record because he just didn't tie them the same way twice. Hmm. But that, no kidding. But, but he's well represented. I mean, you know, I, trust me, I talk about him a lot in the forward matter of the book. And I certainly acknowledge, you know, his influence on my own fly tying. Yeah, definitely. And I think last time I talked to him, he was working on a book on uh, Sid uh, Glasso. Have you heard anything about that? Slowly but surely, I guess. Yeah. Slowly but surely, yeah. What what yeah. about Ken uh, Morish? He was also on the podcast episode in the past. He's got a bunch of good stuff. What, 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 he what, does. One flyer. What's one you picked? Yeah, let's just say, just for example, one of them that I put in there is the Morish Mayday, which is his dry uh, emerging mayfly imitation. And, you know, it sort of encapsulates some of the, the best qualities of a, of a few different flies, like most of our creative flies do. And 
but it's a fly that I've used and uh, tied it myself. You know, it's probably just about the the nanosecond it gained some national popularity. I was onto that one, and uh, because it's such an effective fly and and one of those flies that you can render in a variety of sizes and shades to match specific mayflies. Yeah, it sounds like just from what you're looking at, stimulator, Octobercast. I mean, you you've got a good selection of. I mean, you're covering everything, all the hatches, and is it mostly focused on on? It is like you said at the start, right? Trout mostly. Yeah, it's well, it's trout and steelhead, you know, because I I had to include. I mean, Oregon, you can't escape Oregon's fly tying history with by leaving out classic steelhead flies. I mean, yeah, not to mention a few of the modern steelhead flies, but uh, you know, I mean, this is the state that produced iconic flies, you know, like the Umqua Special and yeah. the skunk and the green butt skunk. I mean, yeah. yeah, you can't you can't get more iconic than that in steelhead fly tying. So. A lot of people don't know that this state also produced the good old spruce fly. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fly that dates back to the early part of the of the 20th century. Oh, wow. We just talked about that on a recent episode. I was, uh, yeah, I think it was Landon Mayer who was talking about that. So who was the spruce fly inventor? Well, there was a, uh, it's an interesting story, you know, that I, wanna, I don't want to give it all away, of course. But, but sure, uh, sure. There, there was a couple of brothers and, uh, and their father that owned a... Uh, tackle store and hardware store of all places in seaside <laughs> it was called godfrey brothers and uh bert godfrey and, and clarence godfrey were the the two brothers and they were the ones involved in in uh, developing the spruce fly there you go good so so all this this is the cool thing about this now we could send people out to get the rest of the story at your book right they could they could pick that's that. right Which, yeah yeah, remind yeah. Us again remind us again where, where is a good place to go if we want to pick up that book well i, I you know i i don't know how many fly shops these days are stocking books like this? I think you know. I think I saw on on social media that the Caddis Fly in Eugene has it. Um, I would, but but I wouldn't be surprised if many of the other shops have it as well. And, and it's always my preference that people support their local fly shops. Uh, but of course, obviously, if you can't find it at your local fly shop, or if you if you're not near a fly shop, you can get it right through Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, you got it, Amazon. Okay. And and you mentioned the Beetle Coachman. Can can you tell us a little about who invented that one? Well, that, I'm glad you asked that, Dave, because researching the beetle bug coachman. Now, see, I, I first bug, yeah. became aware of that fly back in the 80s through uh, Bob Borden uh, because Bob had uh, created a, a beetle bug coachman, you know, his own version of it, sort of. But when I started digging into the history of that fly, oh, I don't know, maybe a decade ago, you know, the Audrey Joy comes right to the forefront in terms of the history of the, uh, the beetle bug coachman. She was the famous fly tire who, who sat in the Myron Frank store in Portland oh, and tied yeah. flies. Uh-huh. But uh, as it turns out, it actually predates even her and oh, wow. very likely was created by a fellow named John Dose, uh, who was a fly tire in Eugene up here. I, th- I believe if I remember right, it's in the book, but I think he died uh, so- shortly after world war two. But what's interesting is John Dose may very well have been the first person to bring parachute style dry flies to Oregon as well. Oh, wow. And uh, the parachute style dry fly was invented back east, but it appears that John Dose was was on it uh, pretty early in, in the proceedings and, and adopted it for his own tying. But it's interesting because when I reached out to some of the senior members of the, the uh, McKenzie fly fishers and a few other people, mm-hmm. nobody had heard of John Dose. And mm-hmm. I think it was just a case of, you know, I'm, I'm just a generation too late right. you know, to talk to the last people who might have had memories of him. And uh but he was a commercial fly tire. He, I mean, he held down a regular job, but he was also a commercial fly tire and well-known angler uh, in the 20s and 30s and 40s down in Eugene. That's it. So, so out of all of your uh, the the 50 in this, how many of them are? Is it a mix of? I mean, like old versus new. I mean, it sounds yes, like you got yes, some. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, a good mix. I mean, the first thing I had to do was make sure I was including all of the well-known or at one time well-known flies, you know, that, that have been around a long time. And then I had to fill out the rest of the book with, with, you know, somewhat more modern patterns. Uh, not, not all of them brand new, but, you know, at least, uh, flies that were developed over the last, you know, 20 or 30 years here in Oregon. And of yeah. course that list could be extremely long, but, you know, I had to, I had to cut myself off somewhere and I had to, to vet it in ways that, uh, not everybody would agree with probably, but like I said, anybody creates a 50 best list no, no two such lists yeah. are going to be the same. There's no way. Yeah. There's no way you're going to get everything. Or, and okay. if anybody wants to argue with me about my list, we can go talk about it over beers somewhere. So Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, maybe, hopefully we could get, this is the struggle, right? This COVID thing, you know, is like, God, we had the flight time, right? It's probably not going again. This Is that the case? Is it kind of out again? 
Yeah, I imagine so. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's a bummer. I mean, we're literally we're going on what like three years of not having the show. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Which is terrible, and uh, but I, you know, it feels like you know, again, who knows where any of this stuff goes? But um, but that yeah, it's a bummer. You know, it's that place where you, you know grab a beer, catch up. Um, how do you stay, you know, with with everything with all this stuff? I mean, how do you keep up to with everybody in the industry? You know, I know I don't think you're a big show person going out to all the events. What do you do? Are you just talking to people as you go? Yeah, you know, I mean, I communicate with it. I guess one of the great things about writing this last book was it, you know, it forced me to to reconnect with some people I hadn't, you know, talked mm-hmm. to for a long time. And and that was great. But, you know, I, I as you know, I've always been a pretty private, you know, fly angler. And uh, so, you know, it, it really hasn't. I wouldn't say I've I've uh, suffered any great uh, inconvenience in terms of not being able to go out and do shows and things. You know, it's that's never to me, the best part about doing shows, you know, let's take that fly tying show for in, in Albany as a great example. The best part about that has always been for me to sit down there and tie flies and suddenly be surrounded by kids. You know, it's it's like, all right. it, to, to me, it's just such a great opportunity for all of us who participate there to, to kind of pass some of what we know on to another generation. And then secondarily, that's a place where I always got to uh, reconnect with not just old friends, but you know, old acquaintances, the, you know, the people that sort of enabled me to make a living at this, you know, the person here and there that comes up and, and wants a book signed and, you know, and maybe I've never met them before, but we have an instant connection, you know, because uh-huh. we, we both share a passion for the same things and they've been, you know, gracious enough to, uh, you know, seek some information through one of my titles or something like that. Exactly. So you like, when you go to these shows, you like, you enjoy the talking to a lot of people and just that whole thing. I think so. I mean, I, I, to me, that's why we're there. You know, we are there to share information to, you know, and maybe to inspire people a little bit. Exactly. It's just, to to me, it's never about, uh, I think it's never about trying to satisfy our own egos. I think it's all about, you know, being in a room full of people that share a similar passion, exchanging information and, and hopefully inspiring some people a little bit. That's right. When you get done with that show, you know, say the Albany or any of these other shows, you have a full day of it. Are you feeling at the end of the day, like totally burnt out or are you feeling totally energized? No, I actually feel energized. You know, I just, I mean, it's like you you can, you can live in a little bit of a void and I am a very private fly angler and a very private wing shooter. And I've always been that way. And, uh, that's just, you know, that's never going to change. I don't need to be surrounded by a bunch of people. I mean, in terms of when I'm fishing and, and hunting, but so, so I get that fix when I do these shows, whether it's a, a show like the fly tying show in Albany or whether I'm doing a personal presentation at a fly tying or a fly fishing club, I do come away energized because it's that kindred spirit. You know, it's just, I'm, I have this, there's, there's a, an electric energy when you are surrounded by a bunch of people who share your interest and who are passionate about it. And, and then you get to have this, this wonderful exchange of information and, and you realize that, and I always realize that, you know, these are the people when I'm talking to a room full of people or, or my table surrounded by people at the fly tying thing, I realize very acutely that these are the people who have engendered my career. These are the people who have made this possible for me because as a journalist, I enjoy sharing information. And as an angler, you know, I, I can't tell you how many hours I've put into, you know, on the water, so-called researching the things I talk about and write about. And so I'm always acutely aware that the, the people that are showing up, are the people who have created the opportunity for me to have this this career in fly fishing. Yeah, which you've done and you've been going. When you look at your career, how many years actually making money in it has that been? What, what's that look like? I started uh, commercial fly tying when I was in high school and I sold my first magazine article when I was a freshman in college. And so, and then I worked for my, I went to work for my first fly shop job the year I got out of high school, the summer after my last high school year. So, yeah, so, I, you know, I've, I've been at it a long time. The Fly Fishing Film Tour is back. It's back again. 2022 F3T at theaters near you. Check out a showing right now. They have some of the best video, movies, production, whatever you talk about, whatever you expect, it's there. We've had a number of guests that have had videos in the event over the years, and that's no different this year. Uh, Captain Jack is back, and uh, and we've got a few other people on the show. I'm going to have to do a little, a little uh, survey to see how many of, of our guests we've had that have had actually 
uh, movies and video on that program. So maybe I'll, I'll circle back around the next one and highlight for you. Really excited to be back on this year and excited that F3T is sponsoring this podcast and we're supporting them. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash F3T. Find a show near you right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash F3T. Okay, back to the show. We're going to start wrapping this up pretty quick, but I, I want to hit on this because I think we probably talked about this way back a couple few years ago when we had John. But the process of, you know, you put together this book and you put together a lot of books. What do you enjoy most about the process? Is there one thing that really sticks out where you're like, oh, man, this really gets me fired up doing it all? Because it's a ton of work, right? It is a ton of work. And, and you know, it's all about uh, project management, honestly. But um, the part that I think I find most enjoyable is doing the sleuthing, you know, digging mm-hmm. for information. And... Uh, that part of it, of course, it's become easier in the digital age. And with every passing day, more and more material is digitalized. But that doesn't change the fact that you have to apply sound research methodology. You know, you still have to know how to sleuth. You have to have a, a radar screen that that uh, is very attuned to wrong information or conflicting information. So you're always trying to, uh, you know, check your sources and uh, double down on the details. And yeah, so it's that part of it I've, I've always found interesting. If it's a That's subject it. matter that if it's a subject matter that I'm interested in, the sleuthing is just a lot of fun. And one of the things that always binds me up is that when I get to researching a particular topic, you you know, especially when you're going through like 19th century newspapers or early 20th century newspapers, you start getting into tangential stuff. You know, one great example is that while I was working on Classic Steelhead Flies book, I'm researching these old newspapers and I'm specifically looking for information about the very first steelhead fly anglers on the Deschutes River. So mm-hmm. I'm reading old newspaper accounts and I find this story. It's a little bit macabre, but I find this story about a guy who committed suicide by sitting on a crate of dynamite and lighting it. What? And the, the way the the way the writer wrote the short story was that uh, I, th- I think the verb was he atomized himself, atomized. meaning he blew himself into atoms. Blew oh, atomized. <laughs> and it's like, holy cow! I mean, you know, wow, what a story, you know. And and uh, so I, I, you know, you, when you start researching old newspapers and things, you start running into stories about all kinds of things that are completely have nothing to do with your topic. But, yeah. you know, you just can't help but, at least I can't, I can't help but reading that stuff. So I, you know, I end up slowing myself down tremendously, but, you know, it's hard not to. Wow. How do you vet that? So you can find this blow, guy blowing himself up. How do you know the truth or, or, you know, on that whole thing? Well, I mean, it wasn't part of my research topic. You know, it had nothing to do with it. It was just a, oh, a gotcha. small, it was yeah. just a short story that I saw in yeah, the yeah. newspaper when I was looking for other information. And gotcha. so, you know, you're looking gotcha. through these old newspapers and you see a headline, you're like, what the heck is that about? You know? And gotcha. so you just, yeah, yeah. you just can't That's help it. yourself. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I want to go down that line just for a second here, the steelhead, because obviously we've got some steelheaders still plenty of people out there love of this. Um, what does, uh, you know, thinking about the steelhead, you know, you mentioned the, the history. So what does that look like? Can you give us a little snippet of the brief history of, of steelhead? If you go back, I mean, when does that begin? In your book, too, right, John? I mean, you've obviously got classic steelhead fly, that, so people can get some of this there, right? Sure. That'll give you the long version. So the short version is that catching steelhead on flies uh, probably, you know, realistically began in 1849. And that's because in 1849, down in California, the population of Euro-Americans in California went from a few to about 350,000 literally overnight. Uh, if the if the year 1849 sounds familiar, it's because that was the gold rush year. So gold rushers came from primarily from the Northeast and from overseas. And uh, those among them who were fly anglers brought the tackle that they had. And what they discovered in the American River were these these uh, bizarre fish that, you know, they, they went out to the ocean and came back from the ocean like a salmon, but they didn't die after they spawned. Huh. So... They didn't know what they were, but they, they called them salmon trout, you know, salmon trout, <laughs> right. and steelhead trout. But so, you know, so a, a few decades went by uh, where people were were catching these fish. But at the time, you know, in the 1850s, 1860s, it really wasn't what I would call a codified pursuit yet. It didn't have a, a genre to it. It didn't have a culture to it. But that all changed uh, largely because of, of a famous fly tire from San Francisco named John S. Ben, who 
pioneered steelhead fly fishing on the Eel River in Northern California. And that was really the beginning of the codified pursuit of, of fly fishing for steelhead. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, you know, in those days, it, it may sound, you know, these days you just drive from San Francisco to the Eel River, but in, in his day, you had to take a steamship, you know, out of San Francisco and up the coast. Yeah, so uh, a little bit of a different beast back then. But, you know, I would say that the John S. Ben is sort of the founding father in a lot of ways, and the Eel River is sort of the founding river in a lot of in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Okay, so yeah, so if, I, if folks want to dig in deeper, they can go to uh, to you that book there. And and how many books? Just to remind us again, how, how many books have you written out there? Do you have going around? Good ones or total? <laughs> now give us a total. Give okay, a total. I, I think it's about twenty. Yeah, twenty books. Yeah, so you're you're that's a lot of books. Yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, I, it's right around there somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And a uh, couple things. I want to wrap, wrap this up. I got a little segment called Coffee Talk. We're, we're going to wrap this up really quick here. But I wanted to go back to that, that list we talked about. Um, Garrett Lesko, uh, what fly did you have from him there? I'm glad you asked that because uh, Garrett, I, I wanted his sculpin pattern. Oh, and yeah. it's a cool fly. I mean, it really is. And it's modern. It's innovative. It's, it uh, borrows concepts from, from a lot of other fly tires. And, and Garrett is such a a meticulously fine fly tire, you know, so it's a great fly. But mm-hmm. the other one that I had him tie, because, you know, he's he's sort of Oregon's, you know, spun-packed deer hair guy, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know if anybody yeah. does a better job with with uh, packing and, and trimming deer hair bugs than he does. Uh-huh. So when it came to Randall Kaufman's floating dragonfly nymph, I th- which is made of spun deer hair and was a very innovative fly at its time, I thought, what better guy to pull this off? you know, mm-hmm. than to ask Garrett to put his deer hair skills to work. And, and he did a beautiful job with that fly. And, and, you know, that, that fly, I have a personal history with that fly, which you can read about in the book. And that's why mm-hmm. I definitely wanted that one in there. So yeah, it was great to have Garrett be able to uh, tie one of Randall Kaufman's flies. So by doing that, you're sort of tying generations together, right? You're, you're taking, yeah. you know, Randall's generation and creating a direct line to Garrett's generation through this, this uh, Oregon fly tying. That's it. That's really cool. What's one steelhead pattern you actually had? Pick out one you had in the book. Well, I mean, there's there's quite a few of the classics in there, but uh, you know, if I were to gravitate towards one of my favorites, it's the Golden Demon. Oh, the Golden Demon. That's a you know? cool old one. Yeah, and I love fishing Golden Demons. You know, I mean, they're just huh. it's such a cool fly, and it's a, a fly, a, a pattern that was brought to the Rogue River by Zane Gray, who discovered oh. it in New Zealand, and uh, he had them tied to order. Uh, when he when he fished the Rogue River, and he was the one who who asked uh, his fly tire to have them tied with bucktail instead of the the uh, mallard feathers that were traditionally oh. used in New Zealand. So so huh. Zane Gray had a direct influence on on the popularity of of so called bucktail or what we call hair wing steelhead flies. Yeah, wow. So Zane Gray and Zane Gray, you considered him a, a kind of an Oregon, uh, you know, obviously a big figure, maybe the biggest, right? Somebody that. Influenced. Well, I mean, in terms of of popularizing the Rogue River steel fishery, no question through his writing. Yeah. Yeah, and who else? Uh, so Zane Gray comes to mind first. Big names, history, historic things in Oregon. Who else is out there that we we haven't talked about, like fly fishing wise? Are there any other like really big names like Zane Gray? You can't write a. Uh, a book about Oregon's 50 best flies without including your dad's fly. I mean, yeah. you know, that's, I mean, that one sort of has to be in there. Right. I mean, and, and right. uh, what's neat about that is, you know, when uh, Doug created that fly um, in the, you know, in the mid seventies, he sort of uh, reinvigorated and maybe sort of created a little bit of a stylistic uh, genre on the Deschutes river because he does the, uh, the two tone body, the two tone tail, the two tone yep. wing. And yep. right on the heels of that come the Randall Kaufman hair wing, you know, flies and, and several designed by other people, you know, sort of borrowing on that same kind of template, but mixing up the color schemes. Yeah. And, uh, but, but, you know, Doug has always been, he's always been forthright about his influences. You know, he, I mean, he was influenced by the Brad's brat and 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 several other fly Mm -hmm. patterns, you know? So, so yeah, there's, there's a nice lineage there, you know, through, through, uh, Enos Bradner in Washington and then your dad and then, you know, onto the Randall's flies and, and even onto mine and, and, uh, and some of Brian Zilly's flies, you know, you can kind of see that lineage when you, when you sort of line up classic style steelhead flies and, uh, and look at the similarities and the differences. That's right. Yeah, no, that's really cool. It's, uh, 
kind of brings goosebumps. You know, I remember when I first connected with you uh, a while back. I can't remember. It was at, I think the maybe it was the Native Fish, one of those events, and we talked. And I didn't realize, you know, that you had a kind of a connection, you know, to my dad. Obviously, you know, in Oregon and stuff, but I didn't realize the influence. You know, I mean, even my own dad, right? I knew he was a guide, right? But I didn't really know. He never talked about it. He never, you know, he never said, you know, we knew the Max can, but he never, but maybe he didn't even know. But um, that's really cool to hear that, that he actually had some influence. You know what I mean? Like, especially now where he, he's kind of, you know, not out there swinging flies anymore. And, and, but he still has that lineage that's influencing people, which, which is amazing. No question. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and that was, and that all happened at the time when, uh, or, you know, in, in his case, a little bit before this, but leading up to the time when Umqua Feather Merchants, you know, started their, oh, yeah. uh, commercial fly tying program. And, That's right. and, uh, they sort of, you know, the commercial availability of, of steelhead flies sort of changed everything. Um, you know, I think that had a lot to do with why bucktail was sort of out and calf tail was sort of in, you know, calf tail is just easier to work with. Yeah. And uh, and faster. So, you know, there's these right. these sort of uh, bizarre influences that have kind of changed the styles just a little bit. But uh, it, it's all you know, I, I find it all very fascinating. And there's you so. know, there's no question that uh, steel it flies go through style changes. But, uh, you know, I think if you were to just empirically, I would say that the Max Canyon for many years and maybe still is was the most popular harrowing steelhead fly on the Deschutes River. No kidding. See, that right there kind of blows me away because I, I didn't really, you know, again, didn't think about it. I mean, in fact, one of the flies that I use, my, you know, the, we have some variations of the Max, right? So the fly that sure. uh, Marty, do you, do you remember Marty Sherman at all? Sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Marty Sherman. Yeah, yeah, Marty Sherman. Well, you know, Marty Sherman for a short time worked with my dad at the shop and, um, yep. and he created this pattern called, he called it the Stewart. And it was yep. essentially a dark, it was like a dark Max can, you know, it had more, uh, it had some golden pheasant uh, crest in it. And it was just, I guess it had a couple of different things, but it was dark. It was black fly. Yep. And, uh, and to this day, when I go to my fly box, you know, like a lot of us, when I pull out my first fly, it's a Stewart. And it's not because I don't love the Max Canyon, but I just, you know, that dark pattern has always been the one that I've gone to, but that's really cool to yeah. hear. So the orange and, and white you think is really, uh, kind of has been a standard or at least was at some point. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's, it's been popular for a long time. And you're right. You know, one of the things that's great about your dad is that, you know, I think he really sort of loves the different variations that people have created. You know, I, a lot of us have created a dark wing version of the Max Canyon, but I also, yeah. you know, when I fish one, I usually fish one in which the wing is built primarily of, of hurls from a peacock sword feather. Oh, wow. Which I think just looks really cool. That's and uh, so I, you know, and, and of course being that I can't, you know, it's hard for me to not sort of fancy up steel it flies a little bit so you know my version always had the golden pheasant dyed golden pheasant crest for tails and that kind of thing but yeah you know i, I you'd probably just empirically i would say that just from observation since the 1980s you know that the max canyon probably is was and probably still is the most the single most popular classic style harrowing steel it fly on the deschutes river i mean you could probably ask brian about that and what his observations are you could ask brad staples yeah you know, a exactly. few of these people that have been around forever i think they'd probably confirm that yeah, that's cool. Nice, John. Well, this has been uh, this has been huge. It's always uh, it's been way more than I expected as far as having fun here, and I think that's what's what's great about the podcast. Yeah. I, I love it's it. Funny, it's funny, Dave. How the, you know, just like the last time, Dave. You know, doing a podcast with you, man, an hour flies by in a real hurry. <laughs> I know, I know. We're we're already at our hour, so I. I, because you know what it is, it's just a conversation. I mean, I, I didn't even think at the start of this, we were going to throw out, you know, talk about the, the max or any of this stuff. Really. I was just like, you know, right. like we said at the start, let's, let's just start talking to see where it takes us. And I think we have a pretty good lesson. Let's take it out here. This coffee talk segment is, is a, a pretty popular thing we got going. So we're just going to hit on a, uh, a question, you know, and I think flight tying is a good one, but first let's talk about what, what you have there. So we're still in the morning. Um, what are you drinking there? What, what's your beverage when you get up in the morning? What, what, what do you have there? Uh, you know, about, about 13 cups of coffee. So you're a coffee guy. I'm a coffee guy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how people function without it. Uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I seek information that confirms my belief that coffee is probably the greatest, uh, invention of, you know, in the history of mankind. <laughs> That's amazing. Me too. I've got two things. You said it both. I, coffee is the, <laughs> if I had to pick one of these two, it's going to be tough, but between coffee and, a, and an IPA, it's like, you know what I mean? And both are yep. kind of like, I think I would probably go with coffee because it's just like, it, it is coffee. So, well, and by the time we switch to the other end of the day, you know, what's funny, yeah. Dave, is I never drink beer at home or extremely rarely do I drink beer at home. Oh, really? 
But, you know, when I'm out, you know, at a pub or something, I, I, I've really sort of embraced the new, you know, sort of new now, uh, the hazy IPA craze a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, the hazies. There's some good ones out there, yeah. But, you know, at home, you know, I'll pour a little Oregon Pinot Noir or I'll, I'll pour a little single malt. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, so good. So we so we got you there. So so I'm going to go back to this question, and this is one that we've already asked before, but I want to just double because I know you – well, let, let's just first start there. So we're talking about the actual um, tying a wing – and using a and not a hair wing, but do you tie many of your flies using just feather like feather wings? Is that still something you've done in the past? Depends on the style of fly, but the answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. So we had this question from the group. I think it was Tim in the Facebook group was just asking about he's struggling about getting those hair wings on top. Do you have a you know when you think is that something easy for you to do or is there a tip there that you would shed some light on? How do you get that thing to not you know what I mean? You put them in, they want to twist on you. What, what do you do there? Yeah. Well, I mean, so yeah. I mean, first off the first thing you always learn in terms of winging flies like this is the soft loop technique. That's very important mm-hmm. because it, it creates direction of pull in your thread that's designed to prevent material from rolling off to the other side. But for most hair wings, I use what's called the flush cut method hmm. where I, I stack the wing. I, I'm a hair stacker. I like them to look neat. Uh-huh. Um, and then I, I pinch the wing right at the tying point between my thumb and finger. I clip it off. Uh, I clip the, the butt ends off right there so I don't have to do it after I've tied it in. And then I, using soft loops, I cinch that thread over those butt ends and cinch them tight and then start applying tightening thread wraps all the way through. So when you, and, and hmm. it's much easier to, to see this, it's in the, it's in the classic Steel Life Flies book. Okay. You can, you know, you can see it illustrated there. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, if you were to grab one, a fly tied like that and yank on the wing, you could pull it out, but done properly, you're never going to lose that wing while you're fishing. Yeah, and I just find it a lot easier than doing. I find it a lot easier than doing reverse wings with hair. So, what are reverse wings? What's that? Reverse wings are are the most durable way to tie a hair wing steelhead fly, and that is where you you tie the hair in facing forward uh, initially, oh, yeah. and then you finish the fly, and then you fold the hair back and use thread wraps to pin it in that backwards position. When you do that, the fly's bulletproof. There's no way that wing's coming out. Does that sounds like that would be kind of bulky up front? How do you avoid the bulkiness? Yeah, it's just a matter of learning thread control. So it's all about, fly tying is all about not using unnecessary thread wraps. And some people are really good at that. And some people just seem to have this nervous tick where they have to keep throwing thread wraps on when they're not needed. Yeah, too many thread wraps is the number one thing. Okay. Nice, John. Well, I think we got a solid episode here. I think people are going to love this one. We've, we've got some class. We did a little history uh, lesson. We dove into it. Uh, anything else you want to give a shout out, you know, as far as what you have going, maybe now or in the next year or whatever, as far as books? Well, you know, I mean, honestly, Dave, the, the shout out I want to give is to all the steelhead anglers out there this last summer who said, you know, let's cease and desist. Let's just not let's not let's not target these fish this year. Yep. And, you know, that's a hard decision to make for all of us. But yep. I was really, you know, just sitting here you know, largely isolated from, from most people. I was really pleased to see how many people on social media and stuff, you know, were sort of calling for a, you know, let's just, let's leave them alone this year. Yeah, I agree. I think we're in a, we're at that place where I think we were, um, you probably remember this. I, my dad remembers this. I remember it back in the early nineties when, uh, yeah. especially on the Deschutes, the numbers went away. My dad quit guiding, you know, he was a guide for yeah. years and he quit guiding for a couple of years. And, and I remember it. It was like, oh, my God, this is OK. And I, but I wasn't a huge I was a steel fisherman, but not like my dad. You know, it wasn't a business, wasn't built around it. And um, right. And it slowly came back. You know what I mean? It slowly came back. And then we hit the 2000s and we had these really good runs. And obviously things change. But I think that's the hope is that we're all going to be around long enough that, you know what I mean? These things, are, they're going to climb back and we're just hitting a, a, a down a bottom of that of that trough. Right. Well, I hope so, you know, and I know a lot of guides out there had a, a very tough year and, you know, but two things happen from that. One, there's a little bit of a, of a clean out of guides. You know, there's probably some people out there that probably shouldn't have been guiding anyways. And then there's, then there's some of the guys that sort of rethought their, their business plan a little bit, you know, and maybe that, maybe that was, maybe they should have done that a lot earlier in their careers, but it's hard to see it coming. But, you know, like, like, uh, I know Mia and Marty Shepard, yeah, you know, they, that's what I was they decided to, uh, to start guiding chucker hunters, which exactly. I think is great. I think they're. I think Mia's maybe only the the second person in Oregon who's a, a dedicated chucker guide. Oh, amazing! You know? So love, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and, I, cool. and I wish them I wish them success. They're they're just they're really nice people. So, yeah, that's exactly. I think we're on the same. I was just thinking about Marty because I ran into him on the river, and he was doing a trip. And uh, yeah, he was talking about doing the bighorn stuff too. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, that, that's right. They're doing that as well. Yeah, yeah, they're doing that. So that's that. that sort of diversification. I think you know it, it's it's one of those things. I guess we all 
have moments when we think, oh, I wish I would have diversified 10 years ago, you know, but I think that sort of diversification will help them down the line. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right, John. Well, I'm going to respect your time and let you get off uh, to everything here today. But yeah, thanks again for doing this one. This is going to be great to get it out there. And uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, everything you're doing there. And we'll yeah. send people out to your stuff. Thank you, Dave. I sure appreciate your time. So there you go. If you want to check out the show notes, check out the links and check out everything else we have going that just takes this further, including a full transcript of this podcast with every single word, including the one I'm talking right now. 296 wetflyswing.com slash 296. If you go over there and type in 296, this episode is going to pop up along with everything else. One highlight, uh, if you get a chance, I mentioned this at the start, but the giveaway, wetflyswing.com slash giveaway is a chance for you to check out and connect with an amazing prize pack. I don't actually know what's going on because we're always changing it up, but go over there right now and see and be surprised. And then send me an email after you click over there and let me know you checked it out. Oh, man, this is good. Deep breath time. It always feels good to take a deep breath. I'm going to be heading out of here. I'm going to be heading out and getting on a plane. The first plane I've been on in a long time, actually. Uh, And so wish me luck. This is going to be good. I'm getting on a plane, and uh, I've got my COVID stuff lined out. I'm feeling good. I'm going to a show. I'm going to be connecting with some people. So if you want to connect with me, Dave at wetflyswing.com. Just send an email. And I would love to see you in person. We're going to be traveling around the country. Finally, as we're coming out of this, we're going to be doing some cool stuff uh, this year. This year is the year. We're going to be getting started. And we've got some good stuff in the work. (sighs) Second deep breath. And we're going to take it out of here. I appreciate your support. Appreciate you. And hope you enjoyed this episode. And hope you can check out a future episode. Subscribe if you get a chance. And you want to get updated automatically. See you in the next one. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.